Hi, I'm Scott Bollier, host of eConversations and director of the Johnson Center for Political Economy here at Troy University. Thank you for tuning in to our show tonight. On tonight's show, we're going to talk about money and banking, both in the United States and around the world. Uh, when you think about what one of the core and fundamental institutions of a free society is, uh, it's a banking regime that doesn't tax people excessively through inflation, that doesn't create unnecessary uncertainty in their lives through changes in the money supply and changes in monetary policy. It's a regime with credibility, constraint, and predictability so that business, business people, entrepreneurs, and individuals can go about their lives as they see fit. Here in the United States, we're governed by the Federal Reserve. Uh, they're our central bank, and they essentially have a monopoly on the money supply. Our guest tonight is, uh, is a West Texas A&M University professor, Thomas Hogan, who's an expert on money and banking. He's going to talk to us about how the Federal Reserve is doing in their job as uh, a provider of money and supplier of money in the economy, and also talk about um, ways that the Fed's hands could be tied more effectively through competing currencies and through some monetary rules. Thomas, it's great to have you on the show tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. Um, let's get into it and uh, start with something that's on. The Federal Reserve has kind of become, um, and Ben Bernanke have become household names <laughs> basically since the Great Recession and the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, many people felt that the Fed needed to step in and take the actions that they did to prop up and save uh, a number of banks and investment banks. Uh, that the Fed did the right thing, and uh, we we really needed them to. Um, basically protect us from falling off of a financial cliff. Um, how do you think the Fed has done both in managing the crisis and since then at, uh, at basically creating a, uh, an environment of predictability and uh, um, reducing risk in the economy? Well, I think if we look at the Fed's actions over say the last 20 years, we, we had, um, pretty good growth period in the 90s, but then we end up with a giant stock market bubble that bursts around 2000. We have pretty good growth in the early 2000s, but we end up with a giant real estate bubble that bursts. And of course, because of that, we have a financial crisis uh, where the Fed has to come in and, and bail out a lot of banks. So economists, when, when considering this period and considering the Fed's performance over this period, I think kind of have three different opinions. There's a small group of economists on one side that that says, the Fed did it right. The Fed did just what they were supposed to do during all those times. The, the internet stock bubble and the real estate bubble didn't really have anything to do with the Fed. And what the Fed did was come in and save us when we did have that financial crisis that the Fed needed to come in and bail out some banks and, and they did a great job. That's a pretty minority view, I think. Um, the vast majority of economists, I, I think, would say, you know, the Fed usually does a pretty good job, um, but they kind of messed it up not seeing the, these big bubbles coming, not realizing that we were having a, an internet stock bubble, not realizing that we were having um, a big bubble in the housing market. I mean, you have Greenspan going on TV in the mid-2000s and testifying in front of Congress that, no, we're not having a housing bubble. And, and he, he said at the time, you know, the United States has never had a nationwide housing bubble that whenever we have those problems, they're always regional and not something that affect the whole country. And certainly he was right that we had never had one at that time. Um, but to a lot of people, it was becoming more and more obvious uh, that we were having an, a nationwide bubble that was probably at least in part due to Fed interest rates. Uh, and then in the financial crisis, of course, the Fed comes in, bails out some banks, doesn't bail out other banks. Um, and some people think that they really did save us, but I think a lot of economists are kind of skeptical by their performance and also by their quantitative easing programs, trying to get the economy going uh, again. Um, and so I think most economists would probably say the Fed is, is pretty good. They do a good job most of the time, mm -hmm. but sometimes they mess it up. Now there's also a small group of economists on the other end that says, you know, the Fed messed up and they always mess up. They, they did it wrong with the recent housing bubble and they, they didn't need to come in and bail out all these banks. They might have, maybe should have bailed out a couple, but especially that the way they did it was certainly um, unproductive and may have, in some cases, made things a little bit worse. Uh, but if we, if we look back even further, 
if we look back at the 1960s and, and 70s when we were having a lot of inflation, obviously that was caused by the Fed. I think most economists agree that the Great Depression was either caused or at least worsened um, by Fed performance during that period. And so really, if we look at the history of the Federal Reserve, um, a lot of economists would say, you know, they've never done a good job. Um, they've done good job during certain small periods, uh, but on average, they tend to mess it up more often than they get it right. And you're, you're kind of one of those people in this last group that says the Fed has um, consistently messed things up and created unnecessary uncertainty. And with respect to the most recent crisis, the housing boom and bust, and then the financial crisis, um, would your point of view be that given that we have a Fed, um, what they should have maybe been doing during that period was doing a lot less and maybe letting markets uh, self-correct and, and, and clean up uh, some of the excess in terms of excess supply of housing, let prices fall even more, um, let some, some more banks fail, uh, as opposed to just this blanket bailout? So, right, so there are a lot of things going, going into those questions, but I, I think at least if you, just, if you think about the bailout, um, the Fed does have some responsibility to try to help banks out and try to help out the economy, especially considering that they helped cause the bubble and cause the crisis, right? But what we would normally think as economists is that we want the Fed to help out banks and not help out banks that are succeeding and doing well and that are the victims of this crisis and not bail out banks um, that are part of the cause, that are making a bunch of risky loans and that are holding very risky assets and that are defaulting on their own account because they've taken excessive risks. Uh, those banks, um, deserve to fail and it's not going to be a problem if, for the economy if they do fail because those assets will get reallocated, the capital in those banks will go to a safe bank rather than a risky bank. So regarding the bailout, we think that the Fed should not have been bailing out all of the banks and especially not bailing out the banks that did deserve to fail. What they needed to do was save the, the safer banks that were kind of victims of, of this. Um, so if we think about the Fed's um, policies. As I said, I think they were, they partly contributed to this crisis by their, uh, through their actions of setting interest rates and having a, too loose of a monetary policy. And um, that's something that is difficult for them because the Fed's job, the Fed's job is inherently difficult, right? They're attempting to manage the, the money supply for the entire country. I mean, essentially what we want is um, for the economy, the economy is growing. It's j almost every year getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Uh, and so the economy needs a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. You know, every year, almost every year, we need a little bit more money than we had before. And there's a question of, well, how much money, right? Yeah. I mean, we want, we want the amount of money demanded by the public that we need for transactions to be the same amount as is supplied uh, by the Fed or by whoever is supplying the, um, the money. Now, in the United States, we have a central bank, we have the Fed, uh, so they've got to try to do that. But that's a very difficult job for them uh, because they're limited in their ability to understand how much money is needed by the market. I mean, if, if we were gonna think about the market for food, um, we wouldn't say the government should supply all the food in the country. They don't know how much food we're gonna need. They don't know the variety of food that, that different people are gonna want. But for some reason, we have one central bank that's going to supply all the money for the entire country. Uh, and so that's inherently systemically difficult for them, right? We, why, um, it, it's much harder for them to try to guess and estimate how much money that we should have rather than having a lot of different people or banks su supplying the money. Um, the Fed, just by the nature of having one single supplier, has a systemic disadvantage rather relative to other markets where we have many suppliers. So it, it's very hard. I mean, you have to think, even with the greatest monetary economists in, in the whole world, even if they're the smartest guys in the world, um, they have a systemic difficulty of not, not knowing and not being able to predict what exactly the demand is going to be. Mm -hmm. And this, this difficulty in the very institution um, of the Fed in the in its setup, this this asking them to be somewhat godlike in yeah. their their knowledge and 
um, in their, their kindness to, to humanity, um, which not, not every person in power is going to be, um, you're asking them to do almost the impossible. And this, this causes uh, a lot of economists to look at alternatives or ways that the Federal Reserve could um, be more effectively run. And yes. uh, you have a, a wonderful policy piece that uh, I want to delve into here and um, talk about that, that looks at uh, ways that we could still possibly have a Federal Reserve, but it could be more effectively constrained mm -hmm. through um, through competition and competing currencies. So, so I, you were getting to this idea, I think, in your last uh, uh, answer, but help us understand what competing currencies would look like. It sounds kind of crazy to me to, right. to think of something other than <laughs> dollars being used in exchange. Yeah, so my recent paper, uh, Competition and Currency, was published by the, the Cato Institute. And the idea is that in America, private banks should issue their own banknotes, that instead of having one entity, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, responsible for all the currency in the United States, mm -hmm. that private banks should be allowed to, to issue their own notes because, like I was saying before, having many people, many suppliers, um, it's more likely that they're going to be able to meet the, meet the demand rather than having one group just guessing. And so this idea, I think, is very foreign to Americans. Most Americans don't realize that for most of US history, money was supplied by private banks rather than by the Federal Reserve. The Fed was only founded in 1913, and so a little less than 100 years that we've had a central bank in the United States. For most of history, uh, for most of US history, we did have private banks that would all issue their own banknotes, and those would be traded throughout the economy. And some countries are still doing this today, or at least in, in some regions. You have places like Hong Kong and Scotland. So in Scotland, this is how it works. Uh, in Scotland, the legal tender, the legal money, are banknotes from the Bank of England. right? And so in Scotland, the private banks issue their own banknotes. And the way it works is that some private citizen brings in a Bank of England note and deposits in it in the bank. and the private bank, uh, Bank of Scotland or Northern Bank, or they, they have several that are doing this, the private bank gives them a private ne bank note. And it says, you know, Bank of Scotland or whatever, and worth one pound. Mm -hmm. And so later on, that person can bring back the private note and redeem it at the bank and get their Bank of England pound back. But while that, while that private note is out in circulation, the, the private bank can take the Bank of England note and invest it. And so, so the private bank is, is making money by taking the Bank of England notes and investing it and holding securities. They put it in the stock market or put it in bonds or whatever and earn a little bit of money until someone comes back to redeem mm -hmm. the private note. right? And so, so they're making a profit by doing that. Um, and the people in, in that region um, really like that. If we, look at, if we look at Scotland, it's something like 95% of the currency supply is issued by private banks rather than by their, their central bank. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like people really enjoy, really enjoy using the banknotes. And so that's a, that's a little bit curious kind of from our perspective because as Americans, like you said, we're so used to just using the Federal Reserve's uh, green dollar notes that we have. Um, but if we look at, at Scotland, uh, there's a couple of reasons why they, why they might want to do that. So first of all, is the issue that, that I said before that you worry, we, we as economists worry about the amount of money in the money supply. So we think that having a lot of banks will make the economy more stable because they're more likely to have the amount they're supplying equal the amount that is demanded by the public, right? So we think probably that's gonna help increase stability. Uh, but I think also for a lot of people, they just enjoy having private notes. You know, the, the private banks, when they, when they print private notes, they can put whatever they want on the notes. And so they have things like local sports teams and athletes and famous heroes. Like in Scotland, they have Robert de Bruce on the, on the note. In Ireland, they have the historical ones like the defeat of the Spanish Armada. The launching of the US space shuttle is on an Irish wow. note, has never been on an American bank note. Right, so if you can think about the way that we would do that in the U.S., I mean, I think that uh, having having heroes and sports teams—that's something that would be fun. I mean, here here in Alabama, you might have some banknotes that say, you know, "Roll Tide," and some that have uh, Cam Newton published on them, or something like that. Whereas where I'm from in Texas, we might have the Texas Longhorns. Or I think people would like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, <coughs> are there any uh, any Scottish notes with Adam Smith, the father of economics, I, I, on them? I, I don't know. <laughs> no, not that I'm aware of, but it's possible. So you, you mentioned um, a period in U.S. economic history prior to the Fed, and uh, this period where um, from about 1790 to at least the Civil War and even into the Reconstruction period, we had many currencies and uh, um, some competition in currencies. Yes. And during that period, uh, looking at your paper, uh, there is significant price stability over the period. Um, so, so prices sometimes go above, a little bit above trend, but then they come back down to, to indicate that the value of money over that period is basically holding steady. Yeah. Now, how is competition um, between currencies driving that? Is it, you know, so if, if one, say, say, say out the state of Alabama um, is the issuer of banknotes, if they oversupply the market, how are they checked in that environment? Right, so there are a couple of different ways that that happens. Um, one is that, it, as you mentioned, inflation. So when we have, um, when the bank issues too many notes, then prices go up, which means the value of the, of the note goes down. And so people worry about whether there, there are too many notes out there because they become less valuable. So on one side, we can think of it just like any other product that banks that are inflating their notes too much, people won't want those kind of bank notes because they become less valuable. And so that is a defective product, right? And so c banks, when they're competing, have an incentive to please their customers and so are less likely to issue too many notes. There's another kind of more mechanical feature of this that has to do with the amount of risk that a bank is taking. So if a bank issues bank notes, they have to keep some cash on reserve uh, in case people want to come in and redeem the notes. They've got to have cash there at the bank that they're ready to redeem. So in the, in the 19th century, they were basically holding gold. So someone would come in and, and redeem a bank note and they would give them a piece of gold. Uh, in this, the more current, um, like the Scottish example, the Sc Scottish bank is holding Bank of England notes. So if people are going to come in and redeem them, they've got to have a bunch of Bank of England notes that they're ready to give out. Right? So the bank has to worry about whether they're going to issue too many notes because they don't want people to come in all at once and redeem a lot of them and because then they won't have enough Bank of England notes, right? So they have to worry about the amount of reserves that they have relative to the amount of money that they issue, right? So, so that's really a um, serious motivator for them because they don't want to go out of business, right? It's in their incentive to not issue too many notes. Uh, and we see that that banks in U.S. history were, were very careful about this. In fact, they, they monitored daily the amount of notes that they have coming in versus the, the amount of reserves that they have, mm -hmm. right? Because um, they worry about a lot of people coming in at once, and they tend to issue, you know, they issue more notes than they have on reserves. Um, and so, uh, so when people bring in notes, it disproportionately uh, decreases their amount amount of reserves and so even so f you know for example uh, if they keep um, if they issue a hundred banknotes and they keep 20 Bank of England notes on reserve or something like that um, if somebody comes in and, and redeems five notes well that's only five percent of the hundred that they've issued but having to give five of their of their 20 Bank of England notes out that's a quarter decrease right so so redemptions greatly affect the amount that they're holding on reserve, and so they have to be very, very concerned about the amount that they've issued, right? And so this kind of incentive prevents them from issuing too many notes because it's not safe. They don't want to fail. So <clears throat> a big difference then between this system with competing currencies and our current system is there isn't a backstop per se, relative to what there is under our current system where we have the Federal Reserve there almost encouraging you to drive down your reserves, right? I mean, you, if you know that if you get into financial trouble with respect to the reserves on your balance sheet, the Fed is there as lender of last resort, that's gonna change your behavior relative to um, the environment you're describing where you're constantly monitoring your reserves and if you don't have enough reserves, you're gonna go out of business. It sounds like there's probably not a backstop there or a, a safety net for a bank, so they need to be much more cautious in their activities. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. that's oh. th that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. The so there are a couple of different aspects to that. So first of all, you're right that in the United States today, we are 
bailing out banks. First of all, the Fed did it. Again, in the recent financial crisis, the Federal Reserve went in and bailed out a lot of banks, some of which should have probably deserved that and others which didn't, that they were risky and we should have allowed them to default. Uh, another aspect of that is that the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, um, Insures, insures deposits for anyone that goes into a U.S. bank that presumably, I mean, most banks are members of the FDIC. So if you deposit your money at an FDIC bank, then it's insured by the federal government, meaning if that bank fails, the U.S. government will write you a check and make sure that you get your deposits back. Uh, that, too, gives banks an incentive to take a lot more risk because the customers aren't worried about whether the bank's going to fail. They know that even if the bank fails, uh, they're still going to get their money, mm -hmm. right? So customers don't monitor banks. They don't worry about whether the bank is going to go out of business. So without someone monitoring them, the, the bank has an in incentive to take a lot more risk, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's one aspect is that we worry about banks uh, failing. The other aspect is that the Federal Reserve, when they're issuing money, they don't worry about whether they're going to fail, mm -hmm. right? If private banks were doing it, they have an incentive not to issue too many banknotes. But the Federal Reserve doesn't have to worry about that. I mean, they're essentially part of the government, and they can issue as much money as they want, and they don't owe anyone for that, and they don't worry about failing. So there's nothing that constrains them mm -hmm. in the same way that private banks would be constrained, mm -hmm. right? And so they can feel free to inflate the money supply as much as they want, and they don't have to worry about the consequences of that. In fact, the people, the American public, were the ones that, that bear the consequences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you just a couple of follow-up questions to this. Um, what would you say to the idea that one of the core benefits to the Fed is that by um, kind of providing this, and the FDIC, providing this environment where people feel safe and where banks feel like it's okay to lend because they have a lot of insurance protecting uh, them mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's encouraging all kinds of investment and economic growth. And your system, while it might be safe, um, is just going to create a lot of business cycles, and it may not actually encourage the kind of economic growth we've gotten with the Fed. So I can, I can understand why people would be afraid of that, but I think that if we look at the evidence, certainly the evidence from US history, uh, it seems to be actually exactly the opposite of that. If we look at um, the 19th century, relative to the, again, the almost 100 years that we've had the Federal Reserve, we find that things were actually quite good before we had the Fed and have been not so good since we've had the Fed. So I think the, the common perception is that, well, the Fed has made things better. But if we look at the data, that just doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, so, so first of all, uh, in terms of economic growth, the 19th century, for the whole, for the whole century, uh, GDP growth was uh, something near 4.5% a year. I think it was 4.4 or 4.5 on average every single year. With almost no inflation, so that must be real. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, right, so inflation's another thing, but, mm -hmm. but relative to that, I mean, the United States, since the founding of the Fed, um, GDP growth has been something like 3.2% over the whole period. If we look at since World War I, mm -hmm. it's been about 3.5, I think. So roughly a point higher. So some people would say, well, the central bank's going to do better and allow us to grow faster. Mm -hmm. That doesn't appear to be the case. I mean, you could say that, well, during the 19th century, there were other things, industrial revolution. Um, that, that's certainly true. But people that said it's going to grow faster under the Fed were clearly wrong, right? The second thing, like you said, is, is inflation. Uh, during the entire 19th century, almost zero inflation. Right? Prices were about the same level at the start of the century as they were at the end of the century. So it seems like the private banks actually did a very good job managing the money supply during that long period. And, and you know, if we look at the period, it is up and it is down just a little bit. Um, but part of the ups and downs were we had a couple of national banks. The first bank of the United States was founded for 20 years uh, at the start of the 19th century. And then I, it, um, in the... Oh, God, 18, I can't remember, 1817 um, or something like that. The second bank was founded, and both of those banks had an inflationary effect. Mm -hmm. And so after they went away, then prices calmed down a little bit. So there was a little bit of up and down, I think mostly actually because of, of those interferences mm -hmm. by the government, but very stable over the whole period. 
again, compare that to almost a century under central banking, and we have something like 2,000% uh, inflation. In fact, it's something like 2,600. And, and so even, just, even if we just look since 1970, uh, the value of the US dollar has fallen by almost 80% over that period. So it's, <laughs> it's bizarre to think about what the, U what the Federal Reserve has done to the value of, of the U.S. currency. Yeah. Completely destroyed those who are trying to save and uh, you know, just retire on fixed incomes. I yeah. think that that's one of the real distortionary effects. Yeah. Let me, let, me, yeah. let me talk about one more thing that I think a lot of people today associate with the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. is that the Federal Reserve tries to, attempts to, manage the business cycles in the U.S. economy. I think you, you mentioned this earlier. So part of their goal um, is supposed to be to dampen the business cycle. That is, when, when we get into a recession, the Fed comes in, puts a bunch of money into the economy, and that's supposed to turn us up a little bit so that we get back on our, on our good growth trend. And when the economy is going too hot, when we've got too much activity, they take some money out of the economy and it kind of calms us down a little bit. And so part of the goal of the Fed is to reduce our, our fluctuations and, and dampen the business cycle. That too is an idea that I think most economists would, would say, yeah, the, the Fed has probably done that. They've, they've maybe done a good job. But for people that have actually looked at the data, that does not appear to be the case. So one of the most famous um, areas are people researching this is Christina Romer, mm -hmm. who was, uh, she was chairman of the, uh, chairperson of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama, mm -hmm. right? So not, you know, not like a hardcore Republican or anything that would, would be doubting the Fed's ability. But when she looks at the data, what she sees is prior to the Federal Reserve, she compares prior to the Federal Reserve versus the period since World War II. And, and what she finds is that um, recessions have not been shorter. They have not been less severe comparing uh, the period since World War II to the pre-Fed period. Now, now, think about the periods here. After World War II versus before the Fed, completely leaving out the period in the middle that was the Great Depression, right? right? Which again, most economists would agree that the Fed at least partly caused the Great Depression, either caused it or, or made it more severe. Right, so we'll give the Fed a pass on the worst depression, the worst problem in U.S. history, and they're still they're still not any better um, than before we had a Federal Reserve. So it's it's pretty clear that the Fed has not done not done a good job managing the business cycle. Mm -hmm. They've not done um, a good job promoting GDP growth, and they've been terrible on on inflation compared to before the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. So it seems like a lot of the a lot of the folklore the reasons that people believe the Fed is so good, when we look at the data, it's actually just the opposite. Yeah, uh, It's interesting you mentioned the Great Depression and the Fed being responsible for that. Um, ben Bernanke, current chairman of the Fed, apologized at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday saying, sorry, it was our fault, uh, which is pretty crazy. Um, this has gone very quickly. You need to come back to Troy, and uh, we need to get you back on the show to uh, to talk a little bit about how to actually implement your competing currencies. But we're we're out of time tonight, and uh, we sure appreciate you. Well, thank you. you. I'd love by. to come back and talk about that sometime, and it, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, and thank you, viewers, for tuning in tonight. Good night. Mm -hmm.